The premier event for infection prevention and control is coming to San Antonio this June. APIC's annual conference brings you the latest research, innovative products, and practical knowledge to help you prevent infection. From inspiring keynotes to thought-provoking panel discussions, APIC 24 curates an extraordinary platform for knowledge exchange. Meet IPs from around the world who face the same daily challenges as you. If you work in infection prevention and control, you don't want to miss this event. Learn more and register to join us in person or virtually at annual.apic.org. You're listening to The Five Second Rule, brought to you by APIC, the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. Together with our nearly 16,000 members, we strive to create a safer world through the prevention of infection. Join us while we talk to infection preventionists and other experts to learn the truth about some common myths related to the risk of infection and to get tips to keep yourself and the people around you safe from infection. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Apex The Five Second Rule. I'm Sylvia Quevedo, your host, and we have an exciting but kind of scary episode to talk about today. We're going to be tackling a fungus. Fungi don't get a lot of play on our podcast, but we definitely want to talk about one that is very, very scary. Um, there have been a number of outbreaks. Um, and specifically, this is Candida auris. And to help us understand more about this fungus that has really caused a problem across the United States, as well as many other parts of the world, we have two amazing APIC uh, members. We have Jessica Arias and Shante Walton. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. Thanks. Happy to be here. Well, let me let me uh, let our listeners know who you are and the important work you do. Jessica Arias, you are a nurse infection preventionist, and you're the infection control assessment response lead with the New Jersey Department of Health in Communicable Disease Service. And that infection control assessment response um, is affectionately known as the ICAR. And you have served as the legislative director in the Southern New Jersey APIC chapter, and you uh, have also served on the APIC Public Policy Committee. So thank you for that. And let's see, we have all the way out west, Shante Walton. You are the health system director of clinical epidemiology and infection prevention at the University of California, Los Angeles Health. And... um, It says here you have uh, responsibility for oversight of the infection prevention program of all inpatient hospitals and about 200 plus ambulatory clinics. And your training is in molecular microbiology uh, and you've got over 13 years of infection prevention experience. So both of you are so well suited to talk about this. Um, So let's back it up. I'm going to start with you, Shantae. Tell our listeners what exactly we're talking about uh, when we say Candida auris. Yeah, absolutely. So Candida auris, uh, as mentioned, is a fungus that uh, generally affects people with weakened immune systems. Um, It's relatively new in terms of it being an emerging organism that poses a very serious global health threat. Um, although you're starting to hear more about Canada Auris, um, it actually was first identified in Japan about 2009. Uh, and so it's just progressed over the years and has become a novel multi-drug resistant organism. Uh, as mentioned, it's caused many outbreaks in healthcare facilities abroad and in the United States. And it's really, really challenging because it's hard to identify in a laboratory setting Um, usually you have to have special techniques to identify this particular pathogen. uh, And just the treatment of this organism has been a challenge. And so um, generally it's hard to eradicate from the environment. Uh, Once it's in in the environment, you have to use specialized products to be able to eliminate it. And in some organizations, um, you know, they've had to 
tear down drywall, you know, just to get rid of it out mm. of the environment. So it's, it's, it's a challenge. So as Shante had mentioned, with this originally being identified in Japan, it actually came from a man's ear and thus Canada Oris. Oris is actually Latin for the word ear. Fun fact. Okay, so Candida auris fungus spreads hard to get rid of. But let me let me go to you, Jessica, because there are a lot of different Candida species. Can you share a little bit about what you know um, and what you've come across in your practice as an infection preventionist in terms of other Candida species and and now this Candida auris? Sure. So I'd say probably the most commonly known Canada species is albicans. Um, You have a yeast infection, thrush. Mm -hmm. Um, It's commensal and opportunistic. So you're seen by a a provider, you're treated. Whereas Canada auris is a fairly new organism. Um, It's emerging, like Shantae had said, um, similar to the climate of COVID-19. And so with this just coming about in the United States in the last uh, seven years or so, we're still learning a lot about it. And so there's challenges in accurately identifying it. And most healthy people um, can have Canada on their body and not have an infection from it. Um, And we often refer to that as colonization. So you may have an organism on your body, it's colonized, it does you no harm. However, if at a point in your life, your health status changes, you start a medication that makes you immunocompromised, you need some type of indwelling device as part of your medical treatment, you're now creating a portal of entry that allows um Canada auris, the the organism of topic today, to enter the body and and cause clinical infection. And so there is no typical presentation for Canada auris. Um, The clinical picture is really going to be that of the the site of the infection. So let me stop you there, Jessica. Um, We taught, well, there's there's a lot to break down here. Our regular listeners of the five second rule um, are pretty savvy. We do have an episode, I think it's episode number two on bacteria, viruses, and fungi, oh my. So w- we do talk a little bit about, you know, the differences among those di- uh, microbes. But let me go back to something you said around, um, and, and to remind our listeners that, you know, we're walking around us healthy folks with all kinds of microbes on our skin, right? Um, I mean, it sounds kind of gross to think that I've got a fungus on my arm. Fungus among us. <laughs> the fungus among us. I like it. That might be our title. I like that. <laughs> um, so to think about that, you know, we're all walking around. We have our microbiome of, of our skin, right? Am I getting that right, Shantae? Yes, absolutely. So we're walking around with all kinds of microbes, bacteria, as well as this these fungi, right? So my understanding is that Candida auris, as you said, Jessica, um, can end up um, infecting individuals who are sick, who are immune compromised. Um, And then if you have to have your skin broken in any way, a line put in, that makes it even harder. But one of the things I read, and I want to point out an article that I thought was kind of cool, it's from Microorganisms, the Journal of Microorganisms. Do you know that one, Shantae? Mm-hmm. You would. I, <laughs> I am not a microbiologist, but I found that this particular article, which came out of the um, Kuwait University, has a really nice outline of, of Candida auris. So I recommend it. It's from the April 2021 Microorganisms. It's available online. And uh, Dr. Suhail Ahmad and Wadha Al-Fuzan um, pretty much break down a lot about this, this fungus. But one thing I wanted to, to point out and to our listeners is, interestingly, it says here many of the Candida species live in our gut, but Candida auris lives on our skin. It likes skin. Is yeah. that... Yeah, Canada auris is a, a colonizer of the skin. And so in instituting 
an active surveillance plan where you're going to monitor to see if there's introduction of Canada auris, um, it's common for there to be a, a composite swab of swabbing a patient's underarm and groin to check to see if they're colonized with C. auris. Okay. And th- okay. So interestingly, so let's go back to colonization, right? Shante, can you break it down for our listeners? Because it is confusing, you know. Um, you can have it on you, but you might not be infected, but you can spread it. Can you can you help our listeners understand that concept a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, just the microbiologist in me, I uh, understand that, you know, we need these bacteria on our skin just to live, you know, have a happy medium. So, um, to have this balance on our skin is not something to be afraid of. It's natural. Um, so when we talk about colonization, it's just them living happily on your skin, not causing any issues. But when you have an active infection, that's where um, the problem begins. So it's usually where there's some sort of off balance where the organism can uh, proliferate or grow more in, in number and create that, that issue where you could develop an infection. And of course, there's, you know, a portal of entry that's required to, to create this issue. Um, but that's sort of how I uh, differentiate between the two. Okay, so, you know, that's important just to remind everybody on the five second rule, when we talk about healthcare associated infections and others, you know, oftentimes we're using those terms of colonization versus active infection. So um, for me, anyway, I- I can't hear it enough. You know, it's important to break that down. So thanks. So the other thing that I want, so how do you treat it? So what, well, no, let me back up. Let me back up. Shante, talk to us a little bit about surveillance, because I understand you've done some research and and published in this area on how do you track it and find it? Absolutely. Um, And so it's very important um, for organizations that have the resources to create some sort of an electronic tool um, to do early identification for patients that have high risk factors. So essentially, you want to identify those that have had uh, either an overnight stay in a facility that either has ongoing or active uh, outbreak of of CRS. Facilities like nurse, uh, skilled nursing facilities that are ventilator capable, um, you know, patients that have had close contact with a, a known CRS patient, either having uh, shared a semi-private room with an individual that was positive, uh, or those that um, have a or colonized or infected with a multi-drug resistant organism, particularly those that are carbapenemase resistant. So those are sort of the high risk factors that we look at in, in the institution as people are coming into the organization. And we sort of flag those individuals for screening. Um, once that, that flag has occurred, then we'll do, as Jessica described, we'll do an axilla and a groin swab on those patients. And, and that's here, your armpit, right? Axilla, that's a fancy yes. anatomic term for your armpit? Yes. Okay, Got just it. checking. <laughs> And so um, what's also important is, you know, having the capability to detect uh, Canada auris um, particularly. So you don't want to do just a a normal culture and then try to identify it that way. We developed here um, at UCLA uh, a way to do it via PCR. So we'll collect those swabs, do a PCR on those patients and anyone that's identified as having CRS is immediately isolated. Um, there are other protocols that are in place in terms of how we're cleaning and managing the environment of those patients that are isolated, uh, as well as a double check once those patients are discharged. Uh, once the cleaning is done, we're doing also ATP testing of the environment to ensure that the cleaning um, has been done appropriately. And then uh, it's just additional surveillance methodology. And then also just ensuring that um, you know, we're double checking the, the products that we're using that's effective against this organism, et cetera. So, so all I want to get to, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Sorry to interrupt, but I do want to get to how we, cause that's a whole other, the, that could be a whole other episode on how to clean it, but PCR polymerase chain reaction testing, is that, did I yes, get that right? Yes, polymerase chain reaction. Mm-hmm. Okay. And Jessica, you had alluded to this, um, you know, not every facility, I mean, Shantae, you're at UCLA, that's a big system, right? 
Jessica, you're with the New Jersey Department of Health. Talk to us a little bit about, you You did start to talk about, you know, this isn't easy to find. If you're a nursing home with an outbreak, um, you might be challenged with staffing or maybe you're um, a facility that is not near a lab that can, can find this. You know, yeah. what do you do or what recommendations do you have for our healthcare colleagues listening? Totally. This is um, a prime opportunity for healthcare partners to work um, across the continuum with public health partners um, and really support care coordination and access to all available resources. So local health um, set up different depending on where you are in the United States, um, but public health partners um, work very closely with the CDC. And one service that is available is the Antimicrobial Resistance Laboratory Network, known as ARLN. Um, and that is a resource where isolates can be sent off to check for different resistance mechanisms to validate that C. auris is isolated um, and can also provide additional resources to do active surveillance to identify if there was silent transmission occurring while that individual was in your facility. Wow. So it's it and it is a uh, an infection that is must be reported to the local public health, right? So it, it is required in many states, not all. However, oh. it is nationally notifiable by CDC. Okay. So when it is identified, you should be reporting to public health. Okay. So let me go to, you know, we all have sadly friends and family that might be um, getting care or might be in, immunocompromised, um, who might be residents of a nursing home. What are, you know, what are some of the, um, what does it look like when someone has candida auris? You know, what might you see in that patient? So some of the active infections um, that we've seen are either from a blood specimen, urine specimen, sputum. And so the, the clinical presentation for that individual is really going to be dependent on the type of infection they have. So if someone is positive for C. Urs auris in their urine, you're gonna expect to see typical UTI or urinary tract infection symptoms. Same okay. thing for a bloodstream infection or a respiratory infection. Okay, so it just depends where it lands in the body. Did I get that right? You got it. <laughs> okay, making it even more complicated, right? Because there's other stuff that could cause those problems. Oh my gosh. All right. So one of the challenges that we know is, and, and Shantae, you started and then I stopped you because I, I want to give it some, some attention. Mm -hmm. On top of everything else, this is really hard to get rid of, right? It lasts on surfaces for a really long time. Exactly. So what do we do? What works on it? I mean, yeah, you, there you can't just wipe it down, right? You can't just spray random stuff. There's very specific protocols for cleaning, right? Right. There are some products that have kill claims for CRS um, that exist on the market. Um, I believe there's one new one that just made the list as of last week. Um, so there are several options that are available. Most often you'll hear organizations using a bleach product or a sporicidal product, which what you would use for C. difficile. Um, to effectively clean um, the environment um, to eliminate this particular pathogen in question. Yeah, that's a really good point, Shantae. Um, the list in reference is the Environmental Protection Agency, List P, um, is a list of disinfectants that are effective against C. auris. Um, but as we had touched on earlier, this is a novel emerging, organ emerging organism and therefore, when the initial guidance came out from the Centers for Disease Prevention and Control, the guidance was to use a disinfectant that is on list K, which is the EPA list for Clostridium difficile, mm. Clostroides difficile. I hate that new name, by the way. I, I said it. I said it. <laughs> but yes. So, 
In that same note, one thing that we've noticed in partnering with healthcare facilities throughout the state is they continue to apply their enteric precautions or C. diff precautions when they're caring for a C. oris patient. But it is important to note that the use of alcohol-based hand rubs is preferred and appropriate when caring for a C. oris patient, unless, of course, the hands are visibly soiled and so on and so forth. Okay, so let me let me make sure I get this right. Because, by the way, listeners, I've I'm getting ready to travel, um, and I need to get bug spray on this. I always have to pop something in about myself, you know. What can I say? <laughs> I have the mic, um, and the e. So I said, "Oh my god, what bug spray do I get?" The EPA has a list, and they can tell you every detail about bug spray. Um, it's very cool. But for C. Oris, Jessica, let me get this right. If if you want to make sure you have the right cleaning materials, you want to go to the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency list, P as in Paul, correct? Yes. P. Okay. And you also said that early in, in the fight against the Candida Oris, you were many many healthcare workers and environmental services folks were directed to the list K as in karate. List K is in karate for C. difficile. For C. difficile. Okay, so I just want to make sure we're separating those two. You they're not interchangeable, right? So the CDC guidance is to use a product from list P, but if that's not available for whatever reason, um, there is some language that would permit the use of a product that is effective against C. difficile. However, the preference is that you use a product that has been vetted and proven to be effective from list P. Got it. Everybody yeah. got that right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, because it's confusing, right? Um, totally. Well, talk to us about healthcare workers, personal protective equipment, and, you know, how they fit in with managing Canada or Shante, what have you seen? You're in a huge system. Absolutely. Um, so we, you know, encourage our healthcare workers to wear uh, what you would um, ask them to for contact precautions. And that means the gowns and gloves when they're caring for patients with CRS. So that's uh, universal for all the facilities um, that I'm responsible for. And, and that, sort of is the education that we provide for all. So contact precautions, gown and glove. Um, what about, you know, the room? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the room is usually terminally cleaned um, each day, which means they're using a, a product that is effective against the RS um, and using that to clean all of the high touch surfaces. So, um, this is done on a daily basis. Oftentimes it's done more than once a day, um, just so that we can keep that bio burden down so that we're not having a struggle with trying to eradicate it once the patient discharges. Here in our organization, we have a very long length of stay. And so we want to stay on top of that um, uh, so that we don't have any issues moving forward. So that article uh, in Microorganisms that I just referenced also talked about one of the challenges with uh, Candida auris species is that it creates a dry biofilm. I'm telling you that to get <laughs> clarity, <laughs> Shante. Um, dry biofilm. So I guess it doesn't need a lot of moisture to create a bio. Like, do you? Does that mean anything to you? So, not doesn't really mean anything to me. A biofilm to me is a biofilm. It's very hard to get rid of from surface. Period. Uh, and so trying to, you know, just ensure that you're cleaning those surfaces is probably the most important point here uh, uh, as often as you can so that it doesn't develop that quickly. Um, I think that's the the key um, to ensuring that you can uh, keep your environment yeah, safe. Yeah, I totally agree with Shante. I think in the, in partnering with our environmental service colleagues, um, there needs to be an emphasis on the cleaning process before you just go wiping down with a list P disinfectant um, because we need a clean surface to allow that disinfectant to work properly. Um, 
So in our in my experience, there's there's been some oversight in adequately wiping down surfaces, hitting all those high touch points within the room where there's likely to be cross contamination. And then even something as simple as following the manufacturer's instructions for use to ensure that it's dwelling and undisturbed for the appropriate amount of time. Yeah, we've we've had a few episodes on environmental cleaning where just reminding our healthcare colleagues that, you know, if the IFU says it's got to sit wet yeah. or dry, you know, to follow that, mm-hmm. there's there's a reason for that. But Jessica, you're you're in uh, facilities that include long term care, behavioral health, dialysis. There are challenges there as well in terms of also the medical devices that are being utilized and how well, you know, if you're in a ventilator, if you're on a ventilator, how well some of that tubing is being managed. I mean, are we not talking about some fundamentals in infection prevention control? You you hit the hammer right on the head. It really does boil down to the basics and the core elements of infection prevention and control. And I think the the approach really needs to be heavily on prevention and so really building relationships with your respiratory therapy departments your environmental service department um, health information technology to integrate things into the electronic medical record those are all it has to be a multifaceted approach to really strengthen prevention so in the event it is introduced and there might have been a breakdown in communication or handoff of a patient you already have measures in place that are done via muscle muscle memory standing policy and procedures a, a normal practice within the facility and i know we we got to touch on contact precautions in the acute care setting, but not so long ago, back in 2019, CDC actually introduced a new concept called enhanced barrier precautions. Yeah. That and that is an option for nursing homes. And and that was really introduced to balance, you know, quality of life with infection prevention, because in that environment, that's that's those individuals' homes. They reside there. And so restricting them to their room indefinitely is just not appropriate. Yeah, because this is this is once you get it, it's hard to treat. Yeah. And currently, with there being no known decolonization method, it's once you have it, um, individuals are known to kind of flip flop from negative to positive on a surveillance screen. And so the the public health message is to maintain those individuals on the appropriate transmission-based precautions for the duration of their health care exposure. Wow. Have either of you experienced uh, an outbreak of candida in your, in your work? Uh, Jessica, have you, you're in the state of New Jersey. Yes. Um, more than I'd like to acknowledge. Um, New Jersey is one of the states who was burdened with Canada Oris very early on. And as you all know, if you're good with geography, I am not the best. We do border New York City, which was essentially the epicenter. Um, and so having the international airports, um, sea Oris has actually been identified on every continent that's inhabited by man. So it's, it's everywhere. And that really, you know, focuses on what Shantae was saying about the, the screening and the questionnaires for any new admissions. I know another important piece, um, you know, going off of your your anticipated travel, Sylvia, is even if you've received... <laughs> <laughs> or not, no. <laughs> try to stay as healthy as can be because, you know, if you receive health care abroad, that's a high risk factor to be screened mm-hmm. for sea or Okay. All right. Now that's, that's a major buzzkill for my trip. But yeah, no, I know these, these microbes, they just, they do not discriminate. Shantae, how about out west where you are? Have you had occasion to deal with an outbreak? So I have not had the pleasure of dealing with an outbreak at my current facility. However, I know that there are active outbreaks occurring in the community. And so my goal is to try to prevent that from Uh, coming into our uh, institution. And so um, we really focus on beefing up surveillance so that uh, everyone is aware of those individuals that we really need to monitor closely. So your message to colleagues would be, you know, we've got to make sure we can identify it? Absolutely. 
My gosh. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, there is a lot to talk about always on the five second rule, um, which is wonderful and sad at the same time because it means we're talking about, you know, healthcare associated infections. And this particular one is quite virulent, it's deadly. Um, it travels and stays in the environment. It just um, has evolved to be resistant to so many of the the treatments. And so it's something that I think the public needs to be aware of, Candida Oris, and, and our healthcare worker colleagues to just be mindful that get back to you the basics, it. right, Jessica? Absolutely. It really boils down to hand hygiene, using standard precautions, putting on that PPE when you feel it's warranted, when there's an increased risk, not necessarily when there's an isolation sign posted outside of a patient's room, you know, using the resources that are available to you to make the environment safe for the people we care for and also for the people we go home to. Great. And Shantae, you know, as a microbiologist, like you said, um, we, we sometimes come out of that balance. And so these microbes are causing havoc on us. Yeah, um, but important to support that laboratory and, and that surveillance. Oh my God, you guys just broke it down for us. Thank you so much, Jessica and Shantae, for all the incredible work you do in infection prevention and control and for sharing some of your expertise on this important topic. And again, for our listeners, you know, you need to check out www.apic.org for some great resources, education on all things infection prevention. Thanks for listening to The Five Second Rule, produced by the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology Staff and the APIC Communications Committee, in partnership with Human Factor. Audio tech is Blake Alfin.